Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Thank you, Kit and Kristen and choir, so much for uh, that uh, meditative uh, reminder of God's love for us. I hope that you have a great uh, Holy Week uh, set aside on the church calendar for so many to uh, remember uh, the death, burial, and especially the resurrection of our Savior. Uh, there is a uh, passage in John 13 where beginning that upper room discourse, the reminder of what was to come, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Satan having put it in the heart of Simon's son, Judas, Simon's son, to betray him. Uh, Jesus having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He picked up from supper and he took off his robes and he girded himself with a towel and began to wash the disciples' feet. I love that phrase, and it reminds me of that this week. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, so I hope you have a, a great reminder and celebration throughout this Holy Week. Friday, we take off from classes not to just give you a break, uh, but to help you think more deeply about the very reasons we take that day off and through the weekend. I hope you have great time at your services as well. Dr. Tom Constable is our senior professor of Bible exposition. Uh, Tom has served at Dallas Seminary as of this year for 45 years. He uh, serves in the Bible exposition department. He received a diploma from Moody Bible Institute and a bachelor's of arts from Wheaton College, then earned his THM and ultimately his THD here at DTS. While on staff, he was the founder of our field education uh, program. Uh, he was the first director of our Lay Institute. Uh, both of those he directed for many years. He also directed our D-Men program for 17 years, and then has recently stepped down from a 13-year tenure as chairman of our Bible Exposition Department. He's ministered in nearly 36 countries of the world written commentaries, as most of you know, on every book of the Bible. And wherever I go, people tell me uh, the value of his material online through Sonic Light and the comments that he makes on scripture and how it helps them in their preparation. He founded the Plano Bible Chapel in 1968. He pastored it for 12 years and then served as one of its elders for 30 years. Uh, some of those staff are here today as well as Mary, his wife. Mary, would you stand? Uh, okay, and then, thank you. And Tom has uh, recently informed us that he wants to spend more time writing and uh, doing other things than just teaching. And so uh, he will finish this semester and conclude his classroom teaching career at Dallas Seminary, but not his association with this, I'm uh, quite sure. But uh, Tom, thank you for your 45 years of ministry. I won't tell you how old I was when you started, but uh, it has been a privilege to work alongside of you. Would you uh, join me, uh, not only in welcoming him to our chapel, but would you join me in thanking him uh, for 45 years of ministry? And before you do, on April the 28th, from about 1.30 in the afternoon till four, there will be a reception in his honor for him and for Mary in a way we can uh, tangibly say thank you to him. You'll hear more about that. But for this morning, would you join me in thanking and welcoming uh, Tom Constable to our chapel platform. It's always too soon to quit. <laughs> that was the title of a chapel message that I heard every spring about this time of the year when I was in college. The college president 
V. Raymond Edmond knew that many of us were reevaluating our commitment to continue our education in view of the rigorous semester that was coming to an end. He wanted to encourage us to persevere in spite of discouragement and failure. You might think this is a strange topic for me to choose to speak on today because I plan to retire at the end of June. But I'm really not quitting or retiring from serving the Lord, only from serving Him at Dallas Seminary. During the past few years, the Lord has expanded a ministry that I have on the internet, a ministry of writing Bible study helps for people around the world, and I'm now able to minister to many more people through my online ministry than I can through my on-campus ministry. So I'm going to pour my energy into that ministry for this foreseeable future. And in doing so, I believe I'm being a good steward of the gifts that God has given me. Undoubtedly, some of you are evaluating whether you should do what I'm going to do or return next fall. Perhaps you're evaluating what you should do beyond that. Sometimes discouragement and failure can tempt us to turn aside from the course we believe God wants us to pursue. It's easy to get discouraged, especially at this time of the year. The Apostle Peter evidently felt this way after he denied the Lord three times in the high priest's courtyard. But Jesus assured Peter that he had a significant ministry for him in the future if Peter would just keep following him. It was too soon for him to quit. I invite you to turn to John chapter 21 this morning to look at a very familiar passage that has been called the epilogue to the Gospel of John. John explains his purpose for giving us his gospel at the end of chapter 20. The last two verses read, many other signs therefore Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. If that was his purpose, why did he go on to give us another incident and another teaching situation in Jesus' earthly ministry. I believe he did so because it answers the question, what should those who have believed that Jesus is the Son of God and have received life through his name then do? What should be our response to believing? So we read in chapter 21, after these things, that is, the previous resurrection appearances that John recorded, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other of his disciples, seven in all. Simon Peter said to the other disciples, I'm going fishing, or I'm going out to fish, as the NIV translates that. And they said to him, we will also come with you. This raises a question. It has raised this question in the minds of countless commentators on this passage, and that is, was Peter abandoning his calling? Was he going back to his job of catching fish, and had he stopped following Jesus? I tend to agree with those who view this not as an abandonment of his calling, but as an opportunity to do something while he was waiting for Jesus to appear. Jesus had told the disciples that he would meet them in Galilee, and the disciples had gone there. They were waiting for Jesus. Peter, being an active man, 
probably felt, well, I can fish, and I love to fish, so I'm going to fish. So he goes out, takes the lead, gets into the boat, and the other disciples say, we're coming with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Common to fish at night, of course, but this night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus, perhaps because of the twilight. They couldn't make out distinctly who the figure on the shore was. Jesus called to them, guys, you don't have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. An embarrassing answer for a professional fisherman. They'd been out all night, yet they had caught nothing. Perhaps they remembered that Jesus had taught them that without him they could do nothing. In John 15, 5, he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. They cast therefore and, when they had, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. This was one of the first miracles that Jesus performed with the disciples after he called them. It's recorded in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Jesus was recreating a lesson for these men. He was reminding them of the importance of following his directions. Because even though they caught nothing, at his word, they caught, they caught a huge number of fish. That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, the common way that John refers to himself through this gospel, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. He dove over the side of the boat and started for shore because he wanted to get to Jesus. This is so true to the character of the disciples that we read elsewhere in the Gospels that John is the disciple who gains quick insight, but Peter is the disciple who takes quick action. They follow through with their characteristic responses here again. Uh, Jesus had already pardoned Peter. He had appeared to him uh, before this event. So this was not the first time Peter met Jesus after Peter denied him. And the other disciple came, disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out upon the dry land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it, and bread. This is a very significant detail in John's story. The fact that Jesus set a charcoal fire for his disciples. The only other reference to a charcoal fire in this, in this gospel is what we read in chapter 18, verse 18, where John wrote that Peter gathered around a charcoal fire in the high priest's courtyard and denied that he ever knew Jesus three times. But this time, Jesus has already some fish and some bread. He apparently picked up breakfast on the way. Jesus, again, is serving his disciples. 
He said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Well, we might suppose that he would have multiplied those fish and that bread. There were only seven disciples. He'd fed 5,000 and again 4,000 with such a meager lunch on previous occasions. But here, he does what is more typical. He uses what the disciples bring to him as well as what he provides. Normally, Jesus does that. He uses what we bring to the table as well as what he provides. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. There are probably at least 153 explanations for the 153 fish that, that uh, John wrote, Peter caught. And they're all kind of symbolic explanations of this number. Obviously, it was a great number of fish, and I think that's the point. And I don't know a serious fisherman who, when he returns to land from a catch, can't tell you exactly how many fish he caught. <laughs> John knew how many fish there were, and there were a very large number of them. This was a grade-A miracle that Jesus had performed through the disciples. Yet, though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus made sure that they all got to the shore. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? That's an interesting comment by John, and I don't think I fully understand why he included it. Why would the disciples question who it was? Couldn't they recognize him? They were in his face here. Perhaps it was the changes that accompanied Jesus' resurrection that made their perception of him a bit unsure. Perhaps it was the beating that he took under Pilate that killed most people who underwent such a flagellation even before they went to the cross. We often think of Jesus' scarred hands and his pierced side as the only marks of his crucifixion I'm not sure about this, but I wonder if we get to heaven, when we get to heaven, we'll see many more scars on our Savior's body because of the beating that he took. Perhaps that's why they couldn't recognize him at first, but they did know who he was. There was no question. He'd reduplicated miracles that he'd done before. He'd said things that he had said before. They knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave them, if, gave them and the fish likewise. Some have suggested that this was a covenant meal that Jesus laid before the disciples, that he was extending uh, provision and acceptance and forgiveness and guaranteeing uh, a, an ongoing relationship with himself that a covenant expressed in Old Testament times. Perhaps that's involved here. John didn't make anything of it. This is now the third time, John writes, that Jesus was manifested to his disciples 
after he was raised from the dead. That is the third time that John recorded in this gospel. So far, Jesus had reminded his disciples of important lessons in discipleship that he had taught them in the years preceding this event. He reminded them that without him, they could do nothing. He reminded them that it was important to obey his commands, and when they did, they would see supernatural things happen. They were reminded of his ability to provide for the needs of multitudes through them. But all of this event is only background for the teaching that follows. John's gospel is notable for this structure of presenting a miracle and then teaching that grew out of it, and we have the same thing in chapter 21. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I'm sure Peter picked up his ears right away when he heard Simon, son of John, bar Jonas, because Jesus only called Peter by this name on the most important events in Peter's life. He used it when he called Peter to be his disciple first, and he used it when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So when Jesus said, Simon, son of John, I'm sure Peter realized something important was coming. Kind of like when your mother calls you by your real name, you know. Only your mother calls you your full name. Other people usually use nicknames. This was Peter's full name. And he said to, to Simon, do you love me more than these? Well, more than these what? More than these fish? More than these nets? More than these boats? I think probably Jesus meant more than these other disciples because Peter had said, though all forsake you, you can count on me. I'll never forsake you. And now Jesus asks a very embarrassing question. Peter, do you really love me? After all, you denied me three times. Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. Take care of the young of my flock, Peter. Many have pointed out that Jesus used a very strong word for love in the first two questions that he asked Peter. It's agapao. It refers to a strong commitment Virtually, he asked Peter, Peter, are you totally committed to me? Peter couldn't bring himself to use that same word when he answered the question. He used a weaker word, phileo, meaning, yes, I have a strong affection for you. After all, he denied his Lord. How could he say that he was totally committed to him? But in spite of his weak response, Jesus gives Peter a commission. Tend my lambs or feed them. Feed my lambs. Jesus had originally called Peter to be a fisher of men. Now he's calling him to be a shepherd of sheep. He called him to an evangelistic ministry. Now he was commissioning him to a pastoral ministry. It's interesting that in 1 Peter, Peter addresses the elders of the church and he tells them to be careful to feed the flock of God which is among you. That was Peter's new commission. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, the two different words. And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. John is notable for using synonyms in his gospel. 
and I take it that tend my lambs and shepherd my sheep, and later on, tend my sheep are all equivalent terms. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time, Jesus used Peter's weak word for love. Do you have a strong affection for me, Peter? And Peter couldn't bring himself to say that he was totally committed to Jesus, so he used that weak word as well the third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. When Peter heard the third question, he was grieved. Not so much because of the use of the Greek words, John says, but because he asked him three times, do you really love me? Jesus goes on, truly I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. In some of the extra biblical references to this term that has been translated, stretch out your hands, it's an obvious euphemism for crucifixion. Peter was telling, uh, Jesus was telling Peter that he was going to be crucified. And in fact, that's what happened to Peter, according to church tradition. He was crucified in Rome about 68 AD. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Those, according to Mark's render, rendering of the gospel, were the very first words that Peter ever heard Jesus speak to him. Follow me. And now John tells us that these are the last words that Peter heard from the mouth of the Lord. Follow me. Peter would indeed follow Jesus Christ to death as he had promised. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, that's John, the one who had leaned back on his breast at the supper, and he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, therefore, seeing John, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Well, isn't that true to life? Peter's just found out what God's will for him is. Now he wants to find out what God's will for John is. We are so interested in God's will for other people. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And in the Greek text, the you is, plural, uh, is singular and it's emphatic. You, Peter, don't worry about other believers and the way I'm leading them. You just concentrate on following me. Our success as Jesus' servants depends on our love for him. But it depends even more on how much we appreciate his love for us. We love him because he first loved us. What is God's will for you? Many of you are asking that question right now. Should I return next semester? What should I do with the summer? What about long-term commitments? Discerning God's will is never easy. It requires much prayer and sensitivity to the Spirit's leading. Sometimes we, dis we confuse discouragement and failure with his leading. And these are sometimes what God uses to redirect us, but not always. 
We must always be careful that our primary goal is to follow the Lord because we love him. When we sincerely want to follow him because we love him, he can, we can be confident that he will lead us where he wants us to go. Though following Jesus is sometimes difficult, loving him never is. He has given us countless demonstrations of his love to us, the greatest of which is symbolized by the cross. This week, leading up to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, we have a special opportunity to concentrate on remembering God's love for us and sending his son to die for our sins. Since this is probably the last time that I'll be able to address the student body and faculty, I'd like to say thank you for enriching my life beyond what I could ever think possible. I thank you students for what you've taught me. You've taught me much over the years, and I thank those of you who have, who have opened your lives to me and enabled me to have a closer, more personal relationship with you that I hope will be ongoing. I want to stay in touch with you. And I thank my fellow faculty members who have taught me so much. One of the reasons the Lord has kept me here so long may be that I'm a slow learner. <laughs> Some of you students are ready to leave after two or four or a few more years, but the Lord has perhaps kept me here for 49 years as a student and as a faculty member because he had a lot to teach me. The privilege of serving on this faculty with these talented and godly men and women has been one that I never expected or hoped for. And I am grateful beyond what words can express. Jesus asked, do you love me? Then follow me. It's always too soon to quit. God bless you as you continue to follow him. And God bless Dallas Theological Seminary. Let's pray. We love you, our Lord, for all that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. How can we do less than give you our best and live for you completely after all you've done for us? Amen. <clears throat>